Good evening, everyone. Good to have you here as we continue the 15th season of the Faith and Life Lecture Series. Thank you for coming out on a cold uh, February night. I'm Pastor Tim Westermeyer, the senior pastor here at St. Philip the Deacon, which presents these as a community service, and uh, I'm grateful for your presence. I always like to ask, uh, how many people have never been to a Faith and Life event before? Wow, excellent. All right, fabulous. Well, special welcome to you. Uh, we're really glad you uh, made your way here. A uh, little context for the last 15 years, we've had five presentations annually. Um, they have ranged from everything from uh, doctors to lawyers to authors to, we did have a politician once. We've not repeated that. <coughs> uh, journalists. Um, all of whom come to talk about how Christian faith is connected to different dimensions of everyday life. Even though this is a series focused on that subject, uh, we actually have not had a ton of sort of what I would call professional theologians, either pastors or professors. Tonight, we are delighted to sort of buck that trend and have someone who uh, does this kind of a thing for his day job. Um, you can read about him in the, in the program. Uh, I always do like, though, when I have the privilege of picking up our speakers earlier in the day, which I did today. And by the way, he came from Philadelphia loaded with a plane full of eagles. No, it's okay. In, in his defense, he is not an Eagles fan. I, I'll let him take that wherever he wants to go. Um, anyway, as I brought him back from the airport, I asked him the question I ask all of our speakers, which is, you know, do you, is there anything kind of off the beaten trail about your biography that someone wouldn't read about in a program like this, for example? And he, he took a little time to think about it, and a, f a few things, it turns out. Uh, when he was in elementary school, um, he came in second, is that right? I was in second grade. Oh, you were in second grade, but you came in first? I came in second when That's I was in second yeah. grade. Right. right. I, okay. He came in second when he was we in second grade in, to, in a competition on, yeah. for fire prevention by drawing a hand that was doing this to a book of matches. So there's that. Uh, in high school, he tried to teach himself how to play the guitar because he wanted to become a Beatle, even though they had already broken up. And then in college, this was at Messiah College out east, uh, D3 school, he was one of the top 10 rated right-handed pitchers, actually top 10 rated pitchers in strikeouts per nine innings, is that right? In the country, and he actually uh, was looked, I know, impressive. Uh, he was looked at by some major league teams, and um, then we got on the subject of baseball, he is a Yankees fan, and I got the sense he could have talked about that for a very long time. So try not to get him onto that subject in the Q&A. <laughs> anyway, we are delighted to have him with us tonight. Will you help me welcome Peter Enns? Hello, everybody. Hello. This is the Midwest. You're supposed to be friendly. Speaking of friendly, uh, when I got off the plane today, surrounded by all these Eagles fans wearing their gear, we got off the plane and we were greeted by the Twins mascot, my flight, and he had a high five of them, then after that was the Vikings mascot. So I thought, oh, this is going to get really interesting here, because they clearly don't know Philadelphia sports, because they'll kill these people, they don't <laughs> care at all. I'm half kidding, but um, then you turn the corner, and you had women dressed as Eagles cheerleaders. You had a big arch made out of balloons of black and green. Go Eagles, yay, welcome to, this is so, this is so friendly. You know, they would not do this in Philadelphia, trust me. But we're so glad you're here, go Eagles. And I'm like, I'm not with these people. I'm just here to go talk at a church. No, don't give me any paraphernalia. I don't want any of that stuff. So anyway, oh gosh. So, well, listen, um, enough about my trip. By the way, it's cold here. And I have one winter jacket, which my daughter informs me is actually a fall jacket, and the zipper's broken. <laughs> anyway, I should know my geography better. It's a little bit cold out here. So, okay, listen, um, I do want to thank you for coming. It, it's not the warmest day out there. And 
it's, it's really my privilege to be here. I've only been to Minneapolis area f a couple of times in my life, and it's, it's quite beautiful up here. And this is just a beautiful venue. And how many of you, this is the first time you've been to one of these events? The first time in this church? Like me, too. That's pretty good. So, all right. After today, this may be the last time in your, this church. We don't know, but <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, Anyway, okay, so my, the topic I'd like to speak with you today a little bit and have a chance for discussion later, too, is this issue that I just, it's, it's a big topic nowadays. A lot of people are talking about it because I think people are feeling more the freedom to be honest about their faith. And that is when you're just not sure what you believe anymore, right? You used to be very certain about things, but something happens and what used to be so familiar and so certain winds up being you're just not sure anymore and you really struggle with what you believe and doubting, right? And there are all sorts of reasons for that and um, oh, I could go through a list of them. I mean, I, I did a, a survey on my blog about uh, maybe four or five years ago asking people, give me two or three things that make it hard for you to stay Christian in this day and age? And the answers were absolutely amazing, you know. And actually, you know, if you don't mind, I would, if some of you just want to just raise your hand, or if you've experienced, am I the only person in this room who's experienced some sorts of struggles with faith? Good, that's a relief, because this would be a long 45 minutes. Anyway, um, but, you know, you have experiences, too. I'm not like the answer man up here. We're all pilgrims trying to work through what it means to follow Jesus, those of us who are interested in that, right? Um, but anybody want to just tell, what is it? Yeah, what, 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 how about you? Uh, science and parts of the Bible that are exclusive of other Oh, yeah. Those are two big ones. Absolutely, yeah. Who else? Yeah, yeah actually, just shout out. Hmm? Church. Church. <laughs> What else? Family. Who? Family. family. Like, like um, family members are suffering, maybe? Or is that what you mean, or just not getting along with them? Both. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll tell you, nothing, I mean, for me, family has been the, probably one of the biggest sources of theological changes in my life. You know, which makes me wonder, you know, why? And I think that's really important. What, I mean, science is huge. Just church is big. Family, relationships, community, that's big. Uh, what else? Politics. Politics. Violent images of God. Violent images of God. That's, that's actually, um, at least the people that contacted me, I got like 300 responses to this survey, and um, that was the number one. And also, the, just the whole issue of the Bible, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> the violence is in the Bible, but it, when it collides with science and things like that, right? What else? Hmm? Multiculturalism. Multiculturalism, right. The, the world is, like, small, right? And we can't be this isolated tribes anymore, so. Over here? Yes. <laughs> well... Some things you can just hit delete and ignore, too, I think. But still, I mean, that makes some of us look really bad, I think, in my opinion. But, uh, yeah. Hmm? Oh, yeah, well, suffering, where's God? Right? Theology? Oh, archaeology, yeah, a, a branch of science, absolutely, yeah. I mean, all those things have hit me, at some, and they still do. I haven't, I'm not like on a beach someplace drinking a Corona, you know, I've solved it all. This is, you know, this is, this is stuff that still affects people today in ways that weren't the case 50 years ago or 100 years ago or 200 years ago. I think we have unique opportunities to work through these issues and to try to define what is faith and how can we maintain that journey of faith, right? So. I mean, you know, for me, I mean, all these things are true, but one of the things that made me shift was meeting other people. Sort of multiculturalism, sort of like that. But, you know, when I was in graduate school, two of my teachers were Jews and really observant Jews. And 
some of my classmates were Israeli Jews, and others were just, they were, you know, just, they were American Jews, not Israeli Jews, and others were Christian, but from very different backgrounds than mine. And they had no conception of, like, how I put the world together in my head. And especially the Jewish students and the Jewish professors, they were just wonderful people. How's that for condescending? And they're really nice, too. You know, it's, um, but that's sort of where I was at the time, right? And, and I just, it just made me think about how, you know, I like these people, and they're so unlike me. And what's God going to do? You know, are they on the right side or the wrong side of the ledger? You know, and always thinking that I'm on the right side and people who think differently are on the wrong side. And so I began asking myself questions, like really threatening questions, like, what is God actually like? I hope he's not the way, hope he's not a he, first of all, but I hope God is not the way I had always been sort of taught, either directly or indirectly, what God was like, which is, can't wait to punish those people who believe the wrong things. Because those Jews have no more chance, probably, of becoming Christian as I do of becoming Jewish. My faith is all that I know. Their faith is all that they know. And they're really good at it. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, what, and who, who am I to say anything about this, right? So, it's just, sometimes just meeting people or, <clears throat> I don't know, reading good books or watching a movie that presents reality in a way that is very different from how you're used to seeing it, but you like it. And you sort of, you've all read good books, you want to be a part of that story where Jesus isn't mentioned once. And you wonder, what, what's the point of all this stuff? I mean, there are plenty of happy people out there, right, who make sense out of their lives somehow. You know, new neighbors move down the street. It's just, it's just basically, just keep your eyes and ears open. It's not hard to have a faith crisis. You know, just interact with people. Don't be in a bubble, right? which is why so many Christian communities actually work at the bubble, because you have to do that to maintain sort of a solidarity, right? I'm not criticizing them, I'm just observing, because that's true. One way to maintain religious cohesion is to isolate yourself from other groups, which is really hard to do with the internet. You know? um, science is a big one for me. I keep... Um, on my desktop, like rotating images of the universe, just to remind me, and probably to depress me <laughs> too, because, you know, I mean, just, you know this, the universe is a big place. I mean, I don't understand the numbers, you know, billions of galaxies. In each galaxy, billions of stars separated by all these light years, you know, I just, what? <laughs> this little tiny Earth, you know, Carl Sagan has this wonderful thing called the pale blue dot, which he talks about how small the Earth is. And, you know, I think of like, was it Psalm 19, uh, one of the David Psalms, um, uh, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And, that's easy for him to say when basically there's a dome over your head and the stars and the sun sort of work in that dome somehow and then above that, that's where God resides, above the waters that are up there and things like that. The worldview, literally the worldview was so different, but for us, there's no up. <laughs> we don't have an up and, and it sort of just keeps going, you know? I mean, the universe is... The known universe, let's get that straight, that's bigger <laughs> than just what we know, but the known universe is something like 93, I don't know, what is it, trillion light years from our point to any point out, you know, and we're supposedly in the middle, because I don't even understand this, everybody's in the middle, you know, I, whatever that means, that just poof, right over my head, but if we are, it's 93 trillion whatever light years, I mean, 93 trillion light years, right, I just, that blows my mind, you know, and I just, you know, what kind of a God is this? <laughs> you know, and what do I have to add to this? What do my words have to add? 
I hate the fact I get paid to talk about God. Who am I to say anything? That's why I always say, I don't talk about God, I talk about the Bible. I got that, that's there, that's in front of me. But God, I cannot fathom. And uh, family, yeah, family is another one. Um, yeah, my, I, I talk about my daughter, Liz. I have her permission to talk about her. She's now 27, she has a baby. But she struggled a lot with anxiety and depression starting at the age of eight. Very extroverted little girl, and then just sort of, it just all went south for her. And uh, I just remember her like she couldn't get out of bed. She hated God. Why is God doing this to me? You know, perfectly normal question for a little girl to ask, or for an adult to ask, by the way. And, um, you know, we tried so long to get her some help, and finally we found someone, and, and she started taking Paxil. And within a week, she loved God again. I'm thinking, okay, I teach Bible. You're messing with my theology right now, girl, because that's not supposed to... <laughs> Prayer or reading Psalms is supposed to fix it. But, you know, it's like, so what are we? You know, are we, are we a mass of chemicals? Is that what our brains are? And what is God like again? And who is God? And what does it matter? I mean, going to church and hearing sermons, even Tim's sermons, going to church and hearing sermons would not fix it. Right? Christian counseling that she went to where they told her to pray more, that wasn't working. The pill worked. I'm very thankful for that pill. Right? But still, it's like... What, what's going on here? You know? See, the thing is, <clears throat> here's, here, here's one point I want to make. Having a crisis of faith doesn't take a lot of work. It's normal. In fact, it's, I think, expected. It's even inevitable. And here's where I feel sort of ripped off in my Christian upbringing. No one ever told me that. What they told me was, if you really have faith, you won't have these crises. Or if you do, just make sure they don't last very long because you don't want God to get mad at you. And so the whole point is to fix you rather than respecting the journey that you're on, which again, as I said, is, is normal. It's, it's how can you not, right? How can you not open your eyes and at some point think to yourself, Boy, it used to be so simple, but I don't know anymore. And what do you do when that happens? See, I think actually faith, well, I mean, faith is many things, but one way of putting it, faith isn't about always feeling certain. Sometimes you do, which is fine. But it's not about feeling certain. Faith is not the same thing as feeling certain. Faith is actually what you do when you're not feeling certain. I think that's when faith actually comes in. So it's, it's normal, you know. Um, okay, let me tell you a story. When my other daughter, I like talking about my kids when they're not here. <laughs> this is payback anyway, but um, no, I got great kids. Uh, my youngest, Sophie, who's now 24, when she was... 16 years old. Um, and I have her permission to tell this story, too. That, I mentioned her in another book, The Sin of Certainty. On sale out there, right? No, that's the yellow one. It's the green one. Okay. <laughs> I'm not selling books here. I'm just, it's in that book. Anyway, I have her permission. And when she was 16, I know that as hard as this might be for all of you to imagine, how many of you have parented and who have been through their teenage years, kids. Probably a lot of you, I guess, right? <laughs> Angels, aren't they? Um, well, my 16-year-old daughter, she, well, how do I put this? She did not worship the ground that I walked on. <laughs> Evidence. She would not friend me on Facebook. <laughs> and then she did. And then she unfriended me for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> Very hurt by that. And then it's like, she was like nasty to me. She was really nasty for like months and months and months. And I, I like, what? Did, I'm like, Job, what did I do to deserve this, right? So um, 
one day, I happened to be coming out of my bedroom, she was coming out of hers, and um, we just sort of met and we had a talk. Like, it was sort of an awkward moment there. And I said, you know, Sophie, what, what's, what's happening here? What's going on? And she just saw for a second, looked me right in the eye, and she said, I don't like you. And then walked down the steps. <laughs> so I'm thinking, I have failed as a father. I failed in my quest. So, okay. So anyway, I'm talking to a guy who was maybe about 15 years older than I was at the time. And I said, you know, I told him what happened, and he said to me, he goes, good for you. So what do you mean good for me? He says, you have to understand that whatever you're thinking is going on, Sophie trusts you enough to be honest with you about what she's thinking. So somewhere along the line, you've built some sort of a culture of honesty where she can just tell you what she's actually thinking without fear. So you did a really good job. So I'm like, okay, I'm pretty <laughs> your father of the year from a failure to an award winner in about five minutes. But you know, that's, what struck me though is that I, I think, you know, the Bible is like this too. You see, struggling and being honest with those struggles, first of all, it's normal to struggle. And it's also quite biblical. It's, it's a very biblical notion, you know. People aren't just strolling through life in the Bible like everybody gets it, okay. And that's why some of my favorite places in the Bible are the Lament Psalms, right? There are about 100, 100 well, there aren't about, there are 150 Psalms in our Bible. Um, about half of them, something is going very wrong. And they're, they're, so, they're honest, so honest that we, some of them we don't even read in church. Or we just skip those parts. I'm, I'm sort of Episcopalian, and I like the liturgies when we read a psalm and read verses 1 to 4, 9 to 11, <laughs> 16 to 20. Leave out the killing the enemy parts, but do the other good parts, which is, I think, probably a smart thing to do. But, um, I mean, Psalm 44, you know, for example, it, it's, the psalmist goes on about how, oh, you know, Lord, you've always been there for us in the past. We hear these stories of this glorious past where you helped our ancestors and you saw them through, and, but where are you now? We need you, and you're a no-show. How many of us have ever thought that? Like, back in the Bible days, God's always showing up and helping people, but I can't get a job, you know, or I can't get a break here, right? So that's even in the Bible, that notion. Like, back in the old days, you were always popping up left and right, and now when we need you, you're not here. And then towards the end of the psalm, he, in the English translations always make it so nice, like, awaken, O Lord. It's basically, wake up. Stop sleeping. How long is this going to go on? I just, I love that about these psalms, you know. And another of my favorite ones is Psalm 73, where this guy is struggling with the fact that he's living a righteous life. He's, he's obedient to God. He's, he's treating his neighbors justly. And he suffers all the time. And yet, the people who are wicked who are not righteous, they have all the money. And they have all the stuff. And he says, that's not the way. And I've, I've read the brochure. That's not the way it's supposed to be. I've read Psalm 1. There are two types of people, the righteous and the wicked. The righteous will flourish, the wicked will be punished. Right? And he says, I'm being punished, but I'm not wicked. I'm one of the righteous. Those guys are the wicked. In other words, I can't count on you. I can't count on you to keep your word. I can't count on you to be consistent. Why do you treat some people one way and another people another way? This is in the Bible, right? Another one, one of my favorite ones is Psalm 88, which is the only completely negative psalm in the entire Bible. And it's this guy is going through a major moment of depression and crisis of faith, and he says, you've abandoned me, everyone has, my friends have abandoned me, it's because of you that they've abandoned me. I have no one to turn to, darkness is my only friend. And that's how the psalm ends. 
Here endeth the reading of the scripture lesson. Darkness is my only friend. I'm completely alone, right? Have you ever felt completely alone and abandoned by others and abandoned by God? Right? Well, there's a psalm for you. And it's brutally honest. It's, just, it's actually beautiful to read it so honest. And I mean, right after that, you go from Psalm 88, the next one is Psalm 89, and it's not much better, although it starts off good. This is, this is one of my favorite psalms because... Uh, okay, sarcasm is my love language. This is a very sarcastic psalm, and I, I always gravitate to that sort of stuff. But... Um, it's, it's a pretty long psalm, and it basically starts off about the first half. It does this over and over and over again. Oh, Lord, you're the best. We love you so much. You know why? Because you are steadfast, and you are true, and you're trustworthy, and you don't break your promises. That you're, you're amazing. Thank you. Also, you are the creator. You created the cosmos. You, no other god is the creator. You're the creator. So, you're mighty and you're trustworthy. You can do whatever you want and you have loving kindness and steadfastness and all these words that pop up in the Psalms. You're amazing. Thank you. It's so good to be your people because you're trustworthy and you're almighty. Oh, and by the way, if you haven't gotten the message yet, you are so trustworthy and you are so strong and mighty. Oh, and when you make promises, they're not going to be broken. You're trustworthy, and you're the almighty creator. You know, one of those promises, this is an amazing promise, O Lord, thank you for this promise. You gave us David as a king, and you made a promise to King David that one of his descendants will never cease sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. What a great promise. We've got stability in our... Thank you. Oh, look... You're so trustworthy, and you're so strong and almighty, and you made this promise. <laughs> of course, you can't break promises because you're trustworthy, <laughs> and you can keep David and his descendants on the throne because you're almighty. Oh, Lord, there's one thing, though. The exile <laughs> to Babylon. You turned your back on your people. And we'd like an explanation. See, when the Babylonians came and raised the temple in Jerusalem in 586, there'll be a test afterwards, write that down, 586 BC. Um, and they took, you know, the residents of Jerusalem captive into Babylon. You know, there was just, there's, there's no king anymore. In fact, what Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, did was he blinded the last king, but not before killing his sons in front of him, thus effectively ending the Davidic line. Which is why after they returned from Babylonian captivity and, and re-entered the land and rebuilt the temple and all that sort of stuff, you began having this idea of God will keep his promise eventually one day by us being able to run our own country again. And first the Persians were there for a couple hundred years, and they were running the show, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans, and Jesus comes in and all that Roman stuff, where this idea of a Davidic king is still in play. But for them, people in exile, they're saying, we should not be here. You should have been trustworthy even in this, you should not have broken your promise. Never did you say it was conditional. There are also other psalms that disagree with that, which I think is interesting. There are other psalms that sort of give a different angle on that. But Psalm 89, it's there. You know what I like about the psalms? Is that they're honest. And not to bore you with this, but I think it's really interesting, so I'm going to talk about it. Around the time of Jesus, there's evidence that the book of Psalms was still a bit fluid like the 150 psalms that we have might not have been exactly the psalms that Jesus had. Probably 140-something, but maybe not the exact 150. Because in the Jewish tradition, they were still making decisions about which psalms will be included in this text that they're going to be calling Scripture pretty soon. And all these negative psalms made the cut. I mean, you have to think about that. They could have... 
They didn't keep all of them, but they kept these. They made sure this lament stayed. Why? Because, I mean, we can only presume for them, it reflected authentic faith. This is a part of what faith is. It's, it doesn't always go well. You know, if you, ever, if you ever start reading the Psalms from beginning to end, which is hard to do, by the way, because they sort of start, they sound all the same after a while, but Psalm 1 is pretty much like you know, there are two kinds of people. Psalm 2, God's uh, king is on the throne, David, and everything's going well. And then Psalm 3, I'm having a bad day. Psalm 4, I'm having a bad day. Psalm 5, I'm having a bad day. Psalm 6, I'm... Like, it's like, it's, it's baked into the pages of the Psalms that being a faithful Israelite is not easy. And if we had time, we could talk about the book of Ecclesiastes or the book of Job, which likewise presents this problem of it's not easy following this God because we don't know what this God's going to do. We don't know what he's doing right now. We don't know when this God's going to show up. I like telling my undergraduate students um, who are afraid to talk about their problems with faith because they can't tell their pastors, and they're afraid to tell their parents. So they tell me, and other professors, and I'm glad for that, right? But I really want to get across to them, like, you're not broken, man. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with you. You're, you think God can't handle this or something? I think there's a reason why these things are part of the Jewish and then eventually Christian scripture. And I think that's really good news. Yeah, so it's, it's biblical. And, you know, this is, I, I teach Old Testament. That's the main thing I do. So let me give you a commercial for why you should read the Old Testament, which you don't do, I'll bet. Okay, anyway. Um, <clears throat> it's in the Old Testament that you find these expressions of doubt and struggling with faith. The clearest example in the New Testament I can think of, of someone struggling with faith, is Jesus in the garden. So there's a really good model in the New Testament. But for the most part, you only get this in the Old Testament. And I want to tell you why, at least I think, we only see this in the Old Testament. The reason is the Old Testament, you know, the events are sort of hard to date them and stuff, but the actual writing of the Bible probably was about a thousand-year process, the Old Testament. The New Testament was probably a couple of generations. And in the New Testament, the tone is, okay, Jesus has come, Jesus is returning really soon. Not in several thousand years, but like, don't get married. <laughs> you know, just, just, you know, just get ready. Just, it's, it's going to happen, and don't worry. I know some people have died, but that's okay. They're going to be caught up in the air. Paul does all this stuff, right? But the New Testament is more triumphant, and there's a sense of urgency to... Hold, maintain this faith. I know you're being persecuted. It won't be long. Hold on. The time is short. The Old Testament is this long span of time. Plenty of opportunity for generation after generation to experience crises, whether it's a national crisis like the Babylonian captivity or a million other things that happen to people generation after generation. We actually today, in 2,000 years of church history, we have more in common with the Old Testament in that respect than we do with the New. We have this long haul that we're a part of, right? And that's why, I mean, I, I encourage my students to, you know, you don't have to read, the Old Testament's long and it gets sort of old after a while, but it's, there's stuff there that's just, it's just gems of honesty of that struggling with God, and we need to hear that. And I think, again, I, I don't want to presume anything here, but I know for myself and a lot of people that I talk to, at least especially at school uh, and college where I teach, they just were never given that freedom to express where they actually are. They were afraid to be honest. And I think that's just a huge thing. Shane, when, when my son was six, I remember he had this moment of honesty with me. I was reading with him the Adam and Eve story, the serpent in the garden. And the serpent said this, and Eve said this, and the serpent said this. And as I'm reading this, my son is going, 
So I ignore him as a good father. And I just keep reading, because I want to get done, because I probably want to watch baseball or something. So I keep reading, and he goes, <sighs> and he's like, <sighs> I'm like, Eric, what's wrong? And he goes, Dad, snakes don't talk. <laughs> and I said, shut up, yes they do. <laughs> if God wants a snake to talk, the snake's going to talk. But you see, the, the thing is that he was having a crisis of faith, in a sense in his own little six-year-old way, because he knew it made no sense, but yet it's in this Bible I'm supposed to take seriously. And actually, what I, what I almost said at that moment, Eric, I teach Bible at a seminary. You're making me look bad in front of him, right? <laughs> and plus, he might hear you, so you just want to talk. That's sort of what I felt like saying at the moment. It's all about me, you know? But what I did say, it's one of these rare times where I think the Spirit of God just shuts my mouth and does the talking for me. And I said, Eric, do you, you, you have a problem with God right now, don't you? He goes, yeah. And I said, tell him. That's what you get to do. Tell, tell God. I'm glad you're telling me, but that's part of what we get to do. We get to complain. <laughs> not murmur, not rumble, not rebel, whatever that means, but complain, Right? Like any good relationship, right? When my wife has a problem with me, which never happens, hypothetically speaking, when she has a problem with me, I want her to talk with me and not with, oh, I don't know, her mother, right? <laughs> and likewise, it goes back the same way too, right? In a relationship, you, honesty is what makes a relationship go, and I think that works with our relationship with God. God can handle it, right? Well, okay, so... It's normal, it's biblical, and also I think the last thing I'm gonna leave you with before we start, how much time do we have? Oh, we're doing pretty well. Wow, it's gonna be a record for me, I might finish early. Um, but uh, the other is that struggling with faith, periods of doubt actually have spiritual benefit. They do something for you that nothing else can do. Uh, there's a, a Puritan theologian, Samuel Rutherford, and I remember hearing this quote when I was in seminary, and I haven't forgotten it. He said, grace grows best in winter. Right? And that, yeah, think about that. It's like when things are not going well, that's when the growth has to happen. It's when we're challenged. It's when things don't make sense. Because then you have, to, you have to make a choice. Do I try to hold on to what's not working? Or do I let go of what is not working and take the risk to do a very difficult thing that we talk about all the time, but that's the hardest thing in the universe to do, which is to trust God. I want to control the universe with my brain. I was doing okay until my mid-40s, and then it sort of stopped happening because <laughs> I had kids who were teenagers and everything fell apart, right? My own fault. But that, those periods of doubt and struggle, actually, they, in a, in a way, refine you. They, see, sometimes we think we're abandoning God when we struggle or doubt, what may actually be happening is we're being led by God to shed the ideas we have about God. And there's a difference between that. There's, it's our thoughts about God, and then there's the real thing. Here's the trick. All of us have thoughts about God that work, but you get to a point in time where your thinking about God becomes God, and you hold on to that for dear life when in fact, maybe God is bigger than our thinking. What I love about, another thing I absolutely love about the Bible, especially the Old Testament again, is that how biblical writers thought about God changes over time. I mean, think about that. The Old Testament doesn't describe God and God's dealings in the world in all the same ways all the time. My favorite example is Jonah. Right? You all know the story of Jonah, swallowed by blah, blah. It's a very sophisticated little novel there. But Jonah, of course, as you know, um, is running away from God because God told him to preach repentance to the Ninevites, 
Now, the Ninevites, that was the capital of the enemy Assyrians who were horrible. I mean, if they captured you, they impaled you. They peeled the skin off of you if you resisted. They were a war machine like you hadn't seen in the ancient world. And so God tells Jonah, go preach repentance to the Ninevites. And he goes, no. <laughs> yes. What if they actually repent? Yes, exactly. That's the point. So he runs away, and then he goes, and he gives like the shortest evangelistic sermon ever in the history of anything. It's, it's what is it like? God's going to destroy in three days. <laughs> and what happens? They repent. Right? And then the part you never talk about in vacation Bible school, the end, when he's outside Nineveh sulking like this. I told you this was going to happen, that we're going to repent. Oh, Ninevites, I hate those guys. And so God makes a gourd grow up and a big leaf covering it there. They're just, shut up. Just have a time out underneath. Get, get some shade. Get the sun off your head. You know, that kind of thing. So, that's, so how does God feel about the Ninevites? In Jonah, um, pretty positive go two books over, you have the book of Nahum, which is all about, thank God, the Ninevites are destroyed. <clears throat> thank, thank you, Lord, for... It's basically all the earth rejoices because... See, Nineveh actually fell in the year 612 B.C. It actually fell. No one was saved. No one... No one accepted Jesus into their heart. No one accepted Yahweh into their heart. And then of ice, it didn't happen historically. They were just destroyed. They're gone. So Nahum is this prophet who's writing around the time of the destruction, the late 7th century. That's his time. That's his moment. Jonah is a post-exilic book. What's happened? Just follow me here. What's happened in the meantime? The people of Judah were in exile. And like me going to graduate school, they're maybe getting to know some of these people. They're captors. They, they, they're babysitting their kids and stuff. And like they're actually, hey, they're just people like we are. And so afterwards, they write a story, not about the Babylonians, that's too close. Let's go back to other ancient peoples, the Assyrians, and they tell a story about how maybe God actually likes outsiders too. I love how that picture of God changes. Why did it change? Because of the crisis, because of the struggle, because of the suffering of exile. Right? And we all go through our exiles, and out of our exiles comes some sort of growth and some sort of healing. I do not think about God the same way I did today, uh, 10 years ago as I do today. And I won't, hopefully, 10 years from now. Where that's going, I don't know. But I have to trust God in that process, you know, because this is a pilgrimage. It is a journey. It's, it's a way. It's not a fortress that we sort of hunker down behind. It's actually a way. It's a path that we walk, which is very comforting and also very unnerving. <laughs> I, want, I want my cable. You know, I want safety inside the fortress. I want to have meals brought to me. I don't want to kill my game. I don't want a journey, but too bad. That's the way it is. Uh, one last thing. I'll just maybe leave you with this. Because um, this is a story I tell a lot, and it's one of my favorite ones. Th this, is, this story, I read this in my basement when I was in between jobs and not feeling very good about life and wondering where my faith was going, because it had been challenged for a whole lot of reasons. And I read this on the internet, and it's about Mother Teresa. And I, I tell my students at Eastern that, you know, my faith was really shaken until I met this woman on the internet. Yeah, they don't laugh either. Anyway, okay. Um, anyway, it was, it's, it's a pretty well-known story, and if you've read, you know, The Sin of Certainty, you probably know this, or if you've, you know, heard this elsewhere, but it's a story of John Cavanaugh. John Cavanaugh was a philosopher, Roman Catholic, a Jesuit, um, who was teaching at St. Louis University. And he was having his own crisis of meaning and crisis of faith, and he took time off from teaching, and he said, I know, I'll go to Calcutta and visit Mother Teresa. She'll have the answer. So he goes to visit her, and he meets her for the first time, and she says, you know, what can I do for you? He says, well, you can pray for me. And she says, what can I pray for? And he says, pray that I have clarity. And she said, no, I will not pray for that. And 
like I wasted a plane ticket. Anyway, you know, why not? Why won't you pray for clarity? And she said, and this is the thing that hit me, one of the two things that, in this story that hit me. She said, I will not pray for clarity because clarity is the last thing you are, is, is the last thing you are clinging to and must let go of. This need to have clarity, this need to have certainty. And then he said, well, that's not really fair, because look at you, you've got tons of clarity. And she laughed. He said, I haven't had clarity a day in my life. But what I've had is trust. So I will pray that you trust God. And I read that, I really remember thinking to myself, I've been doing it wrong. I've been always searching for new ways to have that anchor of clarity here, when in fact that might not be the way this works. And I think what really, I don't hold anyone responsible. It's just the world we live in and maybe the Christian cultures we live in, but no one ever told me or anybody that I know that this is what the faith is actually like. It's not about always being certain and having the answers. It's actually about choosing to trust. Right? It's not about having certainty. It's about what you do when you're not feeling certain. Sometimes we feel really good, right, about our faith. Sometimes we don't. Both are good. Both are needed. And I think the not good feelings can actually lead to more growth than those times when we're just, everything's hunky-dory and we're skipping along and the sky is blue and the sun's shining. So, I don't know. I'm going to stop there. Okay, and now what? Oh, you're going to come up. He's going to come up. Come on, Tim. Feel free to applaud for him. Thank you. Um, that was wonderful. I will begin. I'm just going to say a couple words um, while we let... Peter rest his, his voice. And by the way, in a moment, you will all have a chance to ask him some questions. Uh, there's a mic there and a mic there. So uh, be thinking about questions you might want to ask him. I will also put a plug in. Uh, Lent is beginning. Um, uh, we follow the liturgical calendar here that starts on Ash Wednesday on February 14th. And I mention that only because I wouldn't typically say that. But we happen to be doing a series during Lent uh, on our Wednesday night worship on Jonah. Ooh. and the book of Jonah. Great. So he didn't know that, but thank you for the plug. Okay. Um, we, we, the pastors here actually just had a retreat where we talked about sort of the flow of that series, and uh, I think it's going to be really cool. So thank you for your words for that. Uh, anyway, I'm going to just say a couple things. I, I, I always mention the next event. Um, again, those of you who are here for the first time, maybe particularly for you, um, our next event uh, is featuring a woman named Erin Lochner. Uh, she used to live in L.A. Now she and her husband live in Indian, I Indiana. Um, they've sort of intentionally gotten off the fast track, and they're living, as they call it, slow. Um, so join us for that if you can. It's March 8th, uh, 7 o'clock. If you would like us to remind you about that and future events, you can sign up for emails that we send out in advance of those events uh, on our website, uh, faithandlife.org, with dashes between the words, or on this little thing called Facebook. Uh, we're also there. You can be, like us on Facebook. Uh, so there's that. Also, if you have been following this series and maybe even have our season-long brochure, maybe on your fridge or something, our final speaker this year, Gary Haugen, who's the uh, founder and executive director of International Justice Mission, which is the world's largest um, uh, nonprofit focused on ending slavery, which, by the way, is a bigger problem today mm -hmm. than it ever has been in the history of the world. That's an organization at Eastern, too. We have students involved with trafficking. And things like <clears throat> yeah. That, so yeah, yeah. Anyway, Gary, we're delighted he's going to be joining us, but he had to change the date. So if you have put these dates on your calendar, the new date, I really hope, is right in this program tonight. Um, it's May 3rd. <clears throat> Uh, it used to be in April, I believe. It was originally scheduled for April. So uh, please note that. And then I do want to say a word of thanks. Um, this is, as I mentioned at the start of the, our time together, the 15th year of this, season, of this uh, series. Um, from the beginning, 
This has always been supported through uh, generous support of individuals and some uh, very kind local organizations, uh, businesses, corporations. It's not a budget item of the church. Um, and so I want to say thank you to Productivity Inc., uh, Cressa, Honey Bee Capital, uh, Anselm House at the University of Minnesota, Rapid Packaging, Mally Design, uh, Sparky Abrasives, which was our first ever sponsor, by the way, all the way back to the beginning, Thrivent Financial, um, Motive Action and Mastercraft labels, and then you see the names of the countless people who uh, are kind enough and generous enough to make it possible for us to welcome people like Pete here so that you can hear him at no cost. Many of them are here tonight. Will you please join me in thanking them? <laughs> Um, and then finally, we are in the, 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 the midst, we're actually working hard on this right now, of planning next year's series. We are always open to ideas from people who've been here, so if you want to leave some ideas uh, either here or email me, uh, you can leave those in baskets in, in uh, the narthex. Uh, this little panel tears off and there's a place for you to write your comments. Um, okay, uh, anyone have any questions? And if not, this is going to be really awkward. Aren't you going to plug my books? I'll do it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. do it. Yeah, okay. Okay, this one's really good, and this one's really good, too. Um, this is about, the Bible tells me so, it's about how to look at perennial problems with the Bible from a, I think, what I think is a very honest angle, and this is a lot of the stuff we've been talking about today, the sin of certainty. Just out of curiosity, how many people have read these? Okay. That's okay. How many of you have bought them? I want more hands to go up, but that's okay. <laughs> and I will. I got a mortgage like everybody else. What? Subtext books out of St. Paul, an independent uh, local bookseller is always kind enough to come out and, and uh, sell books for us when our speakers have them. So, yeah, you can check in with them afterwards, and I believe Pete will sign them. Yeah, sure. Afterwards as well. Yeah. But now, questions. Yeah. And I'll get out of your hair. Okay. Here. Questions. <clears throat> can I? Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. Is that how we're doing this? Or? We, we, we're doing the mic? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask you a question about the Bible? Yeah. Have you read it? Okay. Yeah, I think so. That wasn't so. my question. No. <laughs> um, I would love to hear your thoughts about the term, the Word of God, and maybe some history. When did the Bible start getting referred to the Word of, as the Word of God, oh. or did the New Testament Jews think of Hebrew Scriptures as the Word of God, and yeah. do you know like, where that well, came I mean, from? It's not really. I mean, I, 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 have, I can take some stabs at that. I know that within the Bible, you know, the Old Testament says, you know, the word of the God, the word of the Lord, but that usually refers to like a prophetic word. There's no Bible in the Old Testament. You know, they don't have a conception of Scripture. That's something that the, the Old Testament as we know it didn't even arise until beginning during the exilic period and afterwards. And, and there's good reason, not just Psalms, but, you know, the canon, you know, the, the official collection of books, that thing probably wasn't settled until around the time of Jesus, maybe a little bit before or even a little bit after. So, you know, the Word of God, for us, is a printed book, but not for most of the history of Judaism and Christianity for the simple reason that most people didn't read. You know, um, we're bookish people. Most, most people can read in, in our society. Not all, but most can. It's, it's, the, ex, it's the expectation. But um, elsewhere in antiquity, the literacy rates are so low, it's something that's more spoken than read. People don't have a cup of coffee in the morning with their Bible. Because right? there was no Bible. So, but I think, you know, um, you know to, to equate this authoritative scripture with God's word is probably very early, I would say. It's not like a recent development. But it's still the meaning of the changes. And I think in today's culture, especially with evangelicalism in the news and fundamentalism, that's more a byproduct of the last couple hundred years when word of God becomes fighting words. You know, you're doing something like like science, you know, evolution or something, that's against the word of God, you know, and that, that, that idea of equating these two, right, like God is almost even writing this text for some people, or, or people were writing it through dictation, that's, those are very, very recent theories of just how the Bible works, probably the last 100, 200 years, 
That 200 is probably better, so. Yeah, maybe you have fights with friends or something about Word of God or something, I don't know. But <laughs> so, yeah, anybody else? I mean, people don't have to come up to the mic, unless you want. It's easier, okay. Okay, yes, sir. Well, you seem to have had experience with people of religions other than Christianity. Mm -hmm. Is doubt just a Christian thing, or uh, do other religions uh, go through the same struggles? I, from what I understand, certainly from talking to people, it's across the board, I think. Um, a friend of mine is a Jewish professor in New York City, <clears throat> and it's interesting hearing him talk about his children, who are spaced like mine, but about five years younger, and everything he says, just take Jewish out and put the word Christian in, it's the same thing. And it's struggling with how to tie them into a tradition that is ancient, right? The difference, I mean, I'd say one difference between Judaism and Christianity, though, is that Judaism does tend to be self-consciously more based in practice, whereas Christianity tends to be more believe these, this list of things intellectually and then you be Christian. So the problems are maybe a little bit different, but it's, it's still there because, and with Islam I can only guess, but I would say it's got to be because all these are religions rooted in ancient texts and ancient stories and we're living in this world that's so different. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's sort of infecting all of us. I hope for the better. I, th I hope what it does is that it clears away the, the, the clutter of the dopey ideas we sometimes have about God and sort of just whisks those away, sort of like an acid bath, you know? And then you're sort of maybe left with something else to build on that's, you know, more righteous and just and good, so. But, yeah. Don't fight, just one at a time, okay. <laughs> so, so kind of along those lines is... Um and maybe, maybe this isn't really your area, but um, so like, what does one do when you're in those conversations with friends, families, or acquaintances? Yeah. Where, where they're, they're such, they take such absolute positions on yeah. what being Christian means. And I mean, I'm comfortable with the uncertainty and wrestling with ideas and not having perfect answers. Right. But they're like, they're so absolute and this has to be the way. Does one just run and hide and ignore it? Or is there a nice little response one could make yeah. to sort of keep the space more open. Yeah, I think... I'm just curious about that. The burden is on you uh, to keep the space open, too, because... I mean, this is going to... I'll, I'll say this here. I would not say this in those contexts, but I'm not afraid to use the word enlightened, in a sense. Like, once you see things from a different perspective and you see there's a validity there, there's no going back. And until somebody gets to those places on their own... You can't, you can't drag somebody into that. So <clears throat> sometimes you probably have, depending on who it is in the situation, sometimes you have to just walk away. Other times, more gently, I think, never argue, because that, that's what they want to justify their positions, right? But what I you know, try to do myself and I encourage people to do is to say, listen, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I really, I really do, and I respect it. I see things really differently right now, and you know, it's it, we probably just need to, for this point, leave it at that. And you know, I'd love to talk with you about it sometime, but they have to be in a different frame of mind, you know. Um, but that's hard with if you're living in the same house with them, right? <laughs> or you know, the proverbial Thanksgiving dinner. Right. I was going to say, or Thanksgiving dinner. Right. When you're not supposed to talk about. Really right about anything, you know. <laughs> because, you know, every family member has a strong opinion on everything, you know. And, um, yeah, I mean, I have, I have, you know, family members on my wife's side who uh, <laughs> I sometimes want to just shut up, you know. But they're good people. See, that's just it. They're, they're not malicious. They just they have a way of looking at the Christian faith that I think doesn't work. But my job isn't to make them into versions of me either. You know, and like when I think of students, my job isn't to make them into versions of me either. They have to walk their own path. And my job is to sort of help them do that well and not um, coerce them into something. So, but it's, it's difficult, right? So, okay. When people say the earth is more than 5,000, 6,000 years old, does 2 Peter 3.8, where he, God, Peter writes, 
To God, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. I believe that's a big understatement. But yeah. I believe God created the heaven and earth when and how he did it. Yeah. I don't know. Right. Well, People I, who, early believers, couldn't have comp comprehended it a million no, years No, they couldn't ago. have comprehended it, right, yeah. He told Abraham the story he could comprehend. Right. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, God comprehends, but I think in Scripture, I think we always have to remember that it, it's a good question to ask. What question are they actually asking and answering? And what could they be expected to understand about certain kinds of things. Like, for example, I, I expect in antiquity people to think in terms of like, okay, where do babies come from? A man and a woman, okay. Where would they come from? Another man and a woman. Where do they come from? And back, back, back. So at the beginning, there had to have been two that had babies, right? I expect that to happen, right? Um, but, you know, that's not true scientifically, but that reflects their limitations of their world. And my job is not to correct them and to say, oh, they're so silly. They're not silly, they're ancient. I wouldn't have done much better, right? But to understand, okay, what is their theology? What are they trying to say here in the midst of all this ancient language and thinking that I can then appropriate and say, well, how do I think this way in my world today too? That's, hard. that's called theology. That's hard work. That's not just reading some Bible verses. That's, that's actually a big task. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, I need some advice. I'm going to be a camp counselor this summer. And <laughs> okay, don't do it. Next question. <laughs> Over here, maybe? No, go ahead. Okay, come on. How old? So, um, I think it's like uh, fourth through twelfth graders. Oh, not a big range at all, then. <laughs> but, um... I I'm reiterate just... my previous comment. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm wondering. <laughs> Hypothetically. So, how, like, how do I face a situation of younger people expecting me to be a voice of certainty in yeah. their one week of, I'm going to find God this week, and I'm going to know what's up. How do I be the voice of certainty when I don't know anything? Is that your experience that young people will maybe expect that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's hard, you know. Well, that's... That is a childlike faith, right? And, and um, I think see, I, it, those ages are so different and, and they're ready for different kinds of things. But I would say, I bet you are going to find God. You might find God differently than you're expecting to find God. And you, you might walk away thinking about God maybe a little bit differently than you did. And maybe God's going to be bigger. And I would not maybe use a word like certainty, but maybe the benefit of this week is to grow them in their faith rather than have that certainty that they're looking for. What they mean is they just want to feel close to God. I think that's what they really mean. It's not an intellectual, you know, perfection here or something. It's just they want to feel God's presence, you know. And, and um, how do you do that when you're not at that place to sort of deliver the goods? Yeah. Right? I know that. I know, and I think that's a common problem with professors of Bible or theology or pastors or youth leaders, right? And I think the, the best that you can do, well, I, take this the way I mean it, all right? You may actually, in the process of that week, wind up giving them something or modeling something for them that's going to help them a lot more than a camp counselor who has the universe tied up in a nice bow. What you don't want to ever... See, this is a hard thing, because kids are concrete. But if you give them a black and white world, what's going to happen? Well, in high school, it's all going to be, oh, that stuff, that doesn't work. They lied to me. You know how many of my students at Eastern say, my youth pastor basically just lied to me? And I was telling them the same thing. I said, no, they didn't lie to you. They just did the best that they could, but... You're an adult now, and you have to move on. And I think to begin modeling that at a younger age, that's you a gift. You don't have to have it all figured out. No, huh? That's fine that you don't have to have it figured yes, out. Yes, the thing is that to, to create... Um, I mean, I, I get the same question with parents and their children, saying things like, I, I'm just, I used to be so clear about what I thought. I'm not really sure anymore. A lot of stuff's in the air. What do I tell my kids? And I'd say, 
Well, in a way, tell them that when it comes up. Like when your children ask you, like my daughter did, uh, my middle one, when she was 10, she came home from Sunday school and they were talking about the Exodus story. And she goes, Daddy, why did God kill all those Egyptian soldiers? Aren't they God's children too? <clears throat> and first of all, I said, good for you, girl. Good for you. Ask that kind of question. But to model in the home the, the, the reality and uh, that it's okay with God to not always be sure about things, right? What if, I mean, if you're not sure, do your parents still love you if you're not sure about things? Do you think God's not going to love you if you have questions? Do you think God is surprised by your questions? Can, doesn't know what to do about your questions? You know, I, th- I think it's you, you have an opportunity to give them a different vision of what God is like simply by being you and by being authentic, but also by being wise. You're not going to dump everything on a 10-year-old. You might dump some things on an 11th grader, right? I think that's why, that's why I said don't do it, because it's hard, right? I mean, you have to be so attentive to them and to those little hearts and parents that are entrusting their children to you. Of course, they're entrusting their children to you for you to fix them <laughs> and come out perfect. Ignore parents. Parents are yes. horrible. They know nothing of raising children, okay? <laughs> Trust me. Right? But I, I think to, to give them a sense of God's presence by being genuine and authentic, okay. I think that's important because kids, kids pick that up. Kids pick up, they, they know when you're full of it. They know when you're acting all pious and stuff and they don't buy right. it anyway. So, right. Thank you. I hope that helps. You, you have yeah, a tough does, job. Okay. All right. So this question is, um, is going to be kind of in the vein of the, the first question. Actually, um, comes out of one of your books. Uh, so in Inspiration and Incarnation, uh-huh. um, if, I've, if I've understood you right, you advocate for an incarnational model of scripture right. where we have, um, we have God's words in human words, and you did a really good job, I think, showing the humanness uh-huh. of, of the Bible. Yeah. Um, I think my question is, and, and what I've been kind of wrestling with recently is, so there's, there's kind of like the, the humanness of, of the Bible, but then there's also kind of like that God's word part mm-hmm. of the Bible. Where do we start talking about, or how do we start talking about that? Or maybe, this question isn't complicated enough um, <laughs> already, um, it may, maybe the question is like, is it even possible to talk about the Bible as God's word? Mm-hmm. And where do, we, where do we start that? You mean... Um it's easy enough to see sort of the humanness of it, but where's the divineness I of it? I think that's it, yeah. Right. And I, see, this is where, I mean, the more I think about that, I think that's a great question because, I mean, think about, you know, an incarnational way of looking at the Bible, right? Jesus is human and divine. What does that mean? Nobody knows. But there it is, okay? And if you saw Jesus walking around the street back then, you know, would you say, well, there goes the second person of the Trinity, Probably not. You would say, there goes another Jew. So what is it? And I ask my students this all the time. Is it, what is it that makes Jesus, what, what are markers of Jesus' divinity? And they say, well, resurrection. I said, that's the least thing, because gods aren't raised from the dead. People are. Plus, God raised Jesus from the dead. So that's not the answer. Anything else? Miracles. Like, you ever read the Old Testament? People are doing miracles all over the place. doesn't mean they're God. So... What, it, what makes Jesus God? Well, he's really wise and he can confound people. You know, so could Solomon. Everybody, people can confound people. That's not it. What is it that makes Jesus divine? And the answer that I want to sort of point towards, that this isn't entirely satisfactory, but at least to make them think, is that that's not super clear. Maybe in forgiving of sins, that's about the closest, right? Um, or, you know, speaking with authority, not like the scribes, the Gospels say, right? But even so, that's not really a mark of divinity. Well, I want to say the Bible is sort of similar. It's really easy to see the contextual nature of it, right? But how do we see that, let's say, divine presence with the Bible? I think, ultimately, by the effect that it has. It's not by point, well, that verse is really divine, <laughs> without any context whatsoever, and that's all contextual. The, the, the mystery of the incarnation is that God speaks through the normal. And I think that's a paradox of the Christian faith, that we don't see God apart from the humanity, 
right? It's, I mean, that's, the, that's a basic Christian confession. What is God like? It's what Jesus is doing. That's what God is like. That's a basic Christian confession. Like, no, but what's God really like? No, you have, to, you have to keep looking down here into the Son who, you know, divested himself of all heavenly authority and came down to the level of humanity and then of a servant and then a crucified criminal. That's where you find God. And I think the Bible works a lot the same way. The weirder and messier it gets, the more I think I need to keep digging down and not stepping away and looking up someplace to get the, the real thing. And it's, it's, it's a really unsatisfactory answer, I think, for a lot of people. But for me, it's the only way I can think about this stuff and just be fine with not having it all worked out. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. So. Any easy questions for me <laughs> to make me look good? Do you have an easy question? Okay. I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about a corporate crisis of faith or a community crisis of faith? Um, where I'm going with this is uh, Sojourners Magazine's, their title on the front page was, Is This Our Bonhoeffer Moment? I'll leave the question, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But, oh, okay. But I mean, I, the American political context. Yes, and, okay. yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it open at that. Um, so, is about community crises of identity and of meaning of faith. Is there such a thing? Is that what you're asking me? Or do we see ourselves maybe in something like that today? It's, it's more of the, the, the most of American church does not address that the cross was a symbol of empire and Roman foreign policy. Right. We kind of let... Oh, the, we've forgotten that big time. Yeah, yes, I agree with you. And, yeah. And um, yeah, with our with our I'll call him Emperor Epimanes. Right. Epimanes meaning the profane one. Right. Um, but, um, right. Yeah. So yeah, and I think that um, that's that's always been. I think today's American Christian culture is just a replay of things that have been going on since the beginning of actually even into the Old Testament when you mix we put religion with political power, it usually doesn't go well. And we equate the religion with the political power. And that's, it's good, I think, in that respect, to have a separation of church and state. But when the church or churches or denominations or movements simply invest any political reader, it doesn't matter who it is, whether it's Donald Trump or Bush or Reagan or Kennedy, it doesn't matter who it is. If we invest them with the power of the Christian faith behind it, we're doing the exact opposite of what Paul said when he said Jesus is Lord. That means Caesar is not. There's a political implication of that. The book of Revelation is, in my opinion, all about the victory of the slain Lamb of God over the power of Rome and the empire. The economic war machine, which was the Roman Empire, is conquered by a slain, cute little lamb with blood all over the place and martyred followers. They're going to conquer that. So, and, and I think that, that there's a memory lapse. and We keep falling into this lust for power and for creating heaven on earth, in a sense, you know, when Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. It permeates the world, right? So, I mean, I've learned this from many other people who've thought about this more than I have, but I think another way of putting it, a very good question, is our forgetting of the prophetic role of the church, which is to call powers to account for how they treat other people. And it's the poor, it's those who cannot fend for themselves. And for many people, and I will include myself in this, this includes people um, who think differently and act differently about human sexuality than I do. It's their people. And how can we be Jesus in that context? Now, you can disagree with that. That's perfectly fine. I'm not trying to start a fight. But that's, I think, in terms of like what, I mean, true equality and, and liberation and freedom and justice and righteousness, all those great Old Testament words we throw around all over the place, when the ruling powers are not doing that, which they typically don't, what does the church say? How does it speak into that situation? And I, and I think that's forgotten sometimes. And um, I have to have at least a finger or two pointing back at myself when I point it out to other people. But, so. 
maybe two couple more. We'll take a couple more and okay. then we'll call it. I'm wondering if you've read Greg Boyd's um, Crucifixion of the Warrior God, and if so, what you think of his premise that God um, lowered God's self sacrificially to, to live into the contextual ideas that people had about in the Old Testament of who God should be. Yeah, I, um, he has two books. He has The Crucifixion of the Warrior God, which is two volumes. You read that? No, actually, I read Cross Vision. So did I. Okay, good. So we're both normal. We're not going to read two books that are this thick. We'll do the little one. I, I know Greg. He was actually a guest on my, I have a podcast, The Bible for Normal People. Why aren't you listening to it? Okay, anyway, but he was on that, and we talked a little bit about that. But the way you phrase that, I, I agree with that, because I think God is always coming down to the level of where the people are. Uh-huh and embodying that, but then also transforming it, okay. right? So, you know, that's how I explain things like the violence in the Old Testament, which is, do I, do I think God wants to wipe out people and take their land? I want nothing to do with a God like that. But I think the Israelites understood God that way in a tribalistic culture. And I think the cross, part of what the cross is about is saying, we're done with that. It's no longer now sacrificing to God. It's God sacrificing on our behalf, saying we're done with the violence. We're done with all that. So I, I, I agree in, in principle with that. And I, I, that's, a, that's an idea that I try to develop in that yellow book, too, about how you look at things from the point of view of ancient people and what they were thinking. And I can understand why they would say certain things, right? But then sort of the cross is an inbreaking of a new way of looking at stuff and... Um, I don't think God needs blood, right? I don't, think, I don't think he was so mad he needed to kill Jesus so he wouldn't kill us, right? There's something else going on with the cross, which I think is a lot more interesting, where God actually condescends and says, I'm going to beat you at your own game, <laughs> and now we're done with it. So, yeah. So just as a secondary then, um, did you find anything troubling in the book? Um, I have to, yeah, I think, um, I don't know if I would say troubling, but, I mean, I don't want to go into a lot of detail just because of the hour, but there are, I think uh, Greg is, he's still beholden to issues of inerrancy that I'm not. And I think it's very important for him to say all these things in the Old Testament have to have some sort of positive theological reverberation in the New Testament. And I'm more along the lines of, I think some things we just in a sense, grow out of or move past. Because, and I see that happening in the Old Testament itself, one reason why I put it. So I think Greg is is, is sort of beholden a little bit to a bit of an inerrantist kind of way of thinking about the Bible that I think makes him stop short at times of giving what I think is a better explanation of something. (laughs) But you know, that's the thing. It's like, you know, people who work on this disagree. We had him on the podcast. Who cares? You know, it's just like we got to think through stuff, you know, and Greg's a smart guy. You know, he's, he's no dummy, and, and, and he's thought about stuff, and, you know, he wrote a book that's about 1,000 pages long with 10 million footnotes, so I guess he's thought about stuff. So. <laughs> you know, so. Thank but you. thanks. Thanks for the question. So, okay. Uh-oh, you have it written down? I have to. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, I won't remember what I'm thinking okay. about. So I have not read your books, okay. but... Um, <laughs> Christianity can exhibit a kind of certainty. Right. One way, one Lord, only Jesus. Mm-hmm. So my question then becomes, if so, at what point do you think about looking beyond Christianity even as you keep the faith to seek God? Well, I think a lot depends on what we mean by Christianity. And I think, I mean, I know plenty of people who have had to move beyond that because the baggage was so much for them it was actually keeping them from communing with God and I'd like to think God understands that that I think that's okay but um, I think it's healthy at least to examine and really look at other faiths and take them seriously I remember I was on a plane once and sitting next to a woman much older than I was and she found out that I was a professor at a seminary And she studied religions. She was a professor of religion. I didn't know Mm -hmm. that. But uh, she said, oh, well, I'm sure you've studied other religions. And I'm like, 
No, I teach at a seminar. Didn't you hear what I just said? <laughs> but I felt really like she let me have it in a kind way, saying, how can you know your own faith if you don't know what others actually believe? Right? Yeah, the idea that the Word of God is bigger than the Bible, uh -huh. that there are other scriptures that reveal, have revealed the ways and being of God all over the place. Right. And in order to seek God, right. there come points where we need to look beyond and I, know, I mean, C.S. Lewis thought that. Um, I know people in the Orthodox Church that are very open to the presence of, let's put it this way, this presence of the Spirit of Christ everywhere, even if people don't recognize it as such, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't check off all the boxes of their theology exams, you know? And, and, and again, I think, when we, that's why I asked before, what, what, what do we mean by Christianity? I think in our culture, it's so screwed up. It's like, I just almost want nothing to do with, certainly the word evangelical, but then even Christianity, it doesn't, it, it's that stupid little thing, you know, and, and I mean, I want to encourage people to look sort of beyond as well to get a better perspective on yeah, that. Yeah, and what do we mean by God, and is God even bigger than Christianity? Right. No, exactly, yeah, yeah and... and what does this ancient story in this small part of the world, how does it affect the fact that we know that there's a China and even Canada? You know, I mean, they weren't thinking about this stuff back then. It was a small patch of land of Jews and Greeks, right? And that's, that's one kind of conversation. And I think the task of theology is to transpose, if I can use musical language, sort of transpose that liberating yet contextual message into times and places that those stories never really conceived of because they couldn't have. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call theology. That's, that's thinking about this, this uh, bringing together of ancient times and other times. And, and if anything, I just know the church has been doing that for 2,000 years. I mean, you, you're always transposing this into another key. You have to. And in our day, you know, we, because the world is so small, multiculturalism, science, all those things, you know, there's a burden on us that might not have been a burden 500 years ago or 200 years ago, right? And I'm at a lot, I don't know what to do about it, but I'm learning to be okay with not knowing what to do about it. But that gives you freedom to think through it. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's a great question. I appreciate that. Thank you for writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you have a question? I'm, Go ahead. No, that's right. Is it a, ahead, is it yeah, a very simple one? Or, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm teasing you. <laughs> so um, this is maybe a little bit more practical. Okay. A little bit. Um, so as I've been changing in my faith and evolving over the time I've been a believer, mm -hmm. um, I've found myself coming, I guess, a lot more in line of almost an orthodox way of seeing mm -hmm. faith and theology, yeah. um, which I which is a lot more symbolic right. versus uh, Enlightenment, Western right. focus. Yeah. Um, however, I've also, I'm also really convinced that the church needs ideological diversity within mm -hmm. local communities yeah. because uh, otherwise whenever anyone changes and evolves, they move and they go to where people think like them and it's just bubbles upon bubbles mm -hmm. and no one's growing. Right. Uh, however, I've found in any... In any conversation outside of just practical details of life, like if you're trying to talk theology or Bible with people, uh, you, it's ships passing in the night. I mean, there's almost no way to bridge that gap. Right. Um, so you almost have to go to other communions when you're evolving it, yourself. It's nearly impossible. Like, I don't yeah. think anyone has any idea what I'm talking about in right. my church right now, for example. Right, right. So, right. Um, but however, I don't. So, I mean, I don't know what your own personal experience is with mm -hmm. that, because I also don't want to leave. I mean, because right. I love these people also, right. but it's just your, um, a C.S. Lewis quote that's been really uh, profound to me recently is, what you see in here depends a lot upon where you're standing. It also depends upon what kind of person you are. Right, right. Um, and I've seen that to be profoundly true. Right. And you can't change, I mean, somewhat you can change mm -hmm. what people see in here a little bit, but... Right. Not a lot. There are limits, right? right? You are who you are, and right. they are who they are. Right. And, 
Yeah, I mean, that, that is such a common scenario in our day and age, and I've experienced it as well, and, you know, I decided I felt like I had to leave the church, and what I've missed is watching kids grow up. So you miss that community, but I felt I had to go because I was going crazy, and, and I, I would not be growing spiritually. So I, it's, it's a hard thing to do, and, you know, that's why you have, I mean, at least we have different traditions and denominations. At least there are places to go. You have to recreate community pretty quickly, which is hard to do, but at least they're there. But, you know, at least, you know, in the American church scene, denominations exist to not do what you're asking them right. to do. That's right. the problem, right? Exactly. You, you don't have, unless, I mean, you know, there are some communions that are a little bit different. I know I'm, I'm like I, I, I say, I'm sort of Episcopalian. I go there, but I don't join. Because no one's going to tell me what to do. <laughs> now, I just, I talked with Tim over lunch about it. I just can't do denominations because as soon as I join one, I want to fight against it. That's my personality. I know my weakness, so I don't even join. I just, I'm happy. So anyway, but Episcopalians, you know, you could have more breadth there, right? Because, and like the Orthodox Church too, because they're not driven by the fine tuning of doctrine. Right. Certainly the Orthodox Church is more driven by worship practices and tradition and an embrace of mystery, which is a very healthy thing, you know. I think they stand up too much in an Orthodox service, which I'm not going to do. I'm not going to stand up for two hours like, really? And it, surely God would not, not have given me a butt if he wanted me to stand up for two hours. Um, anyway, but... Uh, you know, and Episcopalians somewhat too, they're more defined by their liturgy, right? And that's why I've been attracted to liturgy for that very reason and trying to recreate community for like the fourth time in my adult life. And you keep moving to different kinds of churches that are still rooted in doctrinal precision and biblicism. Right. You're just going to run into the same problem again and again and again if you're not wired that way. And it took me a while to realize how I was wired. And you're probably a bit younger than I am. So you're catching on to this a lot earlier, and I think you'll be happier for it, but that doesn't mean it's an easy decision because you have a community and you probably love those people. Yeah. And you might have to make a decision to say, listen, I'm not going to push things too much. I'm just going to sort of be. And then see how that goes after a few weeks or months. And, and you will hear that voice inside of you just nagging, saying you might have to take a risk in your life and do something else. Yeah. Maybe. Not def I'm not telling you to do right. that. I'm just saying maybe. That may come to that point. But if you're not ready to do that, don't do it. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. So, yeah, cool. it's a great question. It's just such a common thing. So anyway. Um, thank you again, everyone, for coming out. Again, Pete's going to sit out there, and he's happy to take questions uh, and sign books if you'd like. Uh, very glad you came out on a cold February night, and I'm really glad. I was smart enough to invite you, because you were awesome. I so, was smart enough to say yes. That's right. Uh, Even though next time, we should have thought about this. Yes. We were going to do this in the fall, last fall, weren't we? And we couldn't. And you said, oh. how about the first week of February? <laughs> and I said, sure. And none of us thought, winter? <laughs> Super Bowl. We didn't think about that at all. So Next time, we'll fix that. Think about that. I've got a little gift for you oh, as a you. memento of your time with us. This is a piece of granite, Ooh. and it says, uh, it's not like blank. It's not like a lump of yeah. granite, but it says, with thanks, draw something yeah. nice on it when you get home. <laughs> <laughs> with thanks to Peter Enns for bringing faith to life, and we thank you thank very much. Thank you very much. much. Thank you. That's very nice. It's very kind of you. It's heavy.